This is a developer talk, as you can see. We are, I imagine that all of you are contributors or willing to contribute or people interested in Kubernetes. Is anybody that is a developer in Kubernetes can raise the hand? So, okay. And people that want to contribute to Kubernetes, anybody here? Okay, so you are going to find this useful because this, this is a talk about a horror history that we, <laughs> We had to suffer, and you may think that, well, Kubernetes is this fancy project, it's super cool, but there are a lot of horror histories, and this is one of them. So, first of all, let me introduce myself. I'm Antonio Gea. I'm working at Google now. I was working at Red Hat before, and... Uh, I'm Swaita Repakula, also at Google. Uh, previously worked at IBM on different open source projects. Okay, so, first of all, just for the people that know, is not used to Kubernetes, just to understand a bit better how, how the project works, how the project is organized. So, uh, basically, the, the project is, is governance on, on the developer side is based on a special interest group. So, we can have this group or six that are horizontal, like API machinery or scalability, or we have another, inter or another group that are vertical, like network, node, scheduler. Most of the people are used to these verticals in their companies and to the problems that this represents. What is the problem? Uh, this is a problem in the network, or this is a problem in your site, and you have this wall going back and forth. And this happens in Kubernetes too. We have people that is in SIG node, we have people that is in SIG network, and we have bugs and we never know who is, the, who is the responsible. But instead of fighting the ball, we try to collaborate to solve the problem. And this, this talk is about one of these examples where a bug in a component that is responsible from one SIG was affecting another SIG and how do we solve it in collaboration. So this is how the, um, we talked about how the project is organized in terms of development. But this is how the Kubernetes components look like. We have a QLED, we have an API server, we have a controller manager, we have QProxy. And the components are more or less related to one SIG, but doesn't mean that the SIG is the owner. So for example, the QLED, most of the code is responsibility of, responsibility of signal, but SIG network has a lot of bits there. Things happens in API machinery, with the co or the best example is the controller manager. The controller manager is a component that has a lot of code from different SIGs. And at the end, we have all this structure, but at the end, we are coming to this conference, we are having fun together, and we are just people. Most of us are, are paid, and we have companies pay on our salaries, but not all of us, and I would say that not most of us are paid just for working in Kubernetes asking. So we dedicate a lot of time, of our own time, to work on this project because we like it, because we enjoy it, and because it's something that we have fun with. So after this introduction, what I want to do, let's start to explain what's happening. So I don't remember when it was. So in 132, there was a big refactor on the, on the node on the SIG node, on the qubit, about the pod life cycle. And this was 132, I think, was one year ago. But six months later, or because since we release until the users start to use the, the Kubernetes release, there is always a gap, six months, I don't know. But suddenly we start to receive a lot of bugs. And you can see bugs that pods is failing to Pods with failed status IP address, they use it on new pods, but traffic is still going to all pods across many spaces. And people say, well, we have pod IPs, this is SIG network, okay? And then you have another one that is terminated pod and shut down node listed in service endpoint. Okay, service endpoint, this is SIG network too. So Kubernetes sending traffic to draining nodes. Draining nodes, this is going to be SIG node. And this is how we triage. I mean, you don't really know, this is not, we don't have a support people. These people open the bag, and we just go there, and we try to figure out, well, who can help here, and just tag it. And sometimes we tag 
a lot of people, and sometimes we don't tag on the, on the, on the issue of orphan. But this is the idea, more or less, of how do we work actually, okay? So, um, in parallel, as Antonio is kind of dealing with this in the open source, um, I came in from like just looking at the customer issues that I was getting from working at KE. And you can see, kind of fell into these three categories. Um, traffic was being routed to non-existent pods. So we would just get a bunch of complaints. Wait a second, why is my traffic going to something that doesn't exist? It's being black holed, your load balancers are broken. Um, then the next one was, oh, not only is your traffic not going to the right place, it's going to the wrong pod, uh, which can be a pretty big security problem if this happens to you. And unfortunately, we do have people, customers who face that. And then the last one, which was the most interesting thing, um, and kind of the only hint of what might be wrong, where we look at these endpoint slice objects, and for those who are like familiar, that basically kind of has all the endpoints for a service. Um, and in that grouping, I feel like my voice is going in and out. Um, we can continue. Better? Yeah, okay. Um, and then the last thing we saw were that there are IPs that were showing up in here that just do not exist. Like, I could not find what these pods were connected to. If we... So let's take like a step back um, from those symptoms. I went and I was like, there is nothing wrong. The network, the network is fine. Endpoint slice controller is fine. I said, we didn't make any changes in OSS. It can't be our fault. Um, well, if we take a look at this pod lifecycle diagram, right? And people are probably very familiar with this if you've deployed a pod before. Um, you enter in at the top and it goes into that pending state before it's scheduled. Once it's scheduled, it might be unknown for a little bit, but once, you know, Kubelet has a probe and it's getting marked as ready, we get moved into this running state. And those top three states over there could be in a cycle, right? Like a pod gets restarted, it gets rescheduled, um, it crashes, you know, all sorts of things. There are two states at the bottom, which we are called, uh, that are called terminal states, succeeded and failed. And the key thing here is once you get into one of those states, you cannot go up to one of the other ones. Um, that definition has been there for a while, but in 122, it was enforced in the code. Um, and I do see big nose people here, so keep me <laughs> honest. <laughs> um, so that was part of the refactor, it was kind of making this change so that way it, um, it once you get into the state, it can't go back. Um, and then really your only option is for this to be deleted, which overall that makes sense, right? From a pod lifecycle standpoint, that totally makes sense. Um, and then just as like a quick kind of how does pod readiness work, uh, Kubelet has kind of a probe, it goes, checks in the, on the pod, are you ready? It says, yes, I am. Kubelet uses that. It says, hey, let me update the API server. And then the bottom left, component there is kind of the controller manager. So it has the endpoints and the endpoint slice controllers that are kind of packaged into that. And we read that information to determine and make uh, service decisions or endpoint decisions. Um, so I'm gonna deep dive in a little bit more. So the first thing is to talk about uh, odd shutdown. And this is kind of before 122 and before the refactor. Uh, the typical scenario is a user will um, User will delete the pod, so it's like an API call, there is a deletion timestamp set on the pod, that will get signaled to the kubelet. I have simplified this diagram, there are other steps involved, but I'm gonna make it very simple. Uh, kubelet basically signals to shut down the pod through the container runtime. The pod uh, goes away. Kubelet will also update the status saying, hey, this is no longer a pod, it usually goes into unknown. And the, another thing it does is it removed the pod IP. Uh, there's a slight variation of this, and that happens when you're doing evictions. Uh, we skip kind of the first few steps, and Kubelet usually will make a decision and say, hey, this pod needs to go, maybe it's because there's no more memory, we need more CPU. It's made that decision, so it will directly shut down uh, the pod. And in those cases, again, the pod IP is removed. In those cases, when a pod is evicted, it's also considered a terminal state. 
So it is in that uh, failed state usually. And if you look at the diagram at the bottom right, we have three different uh, types of terminal pods. So the top one is completed, so that means it would have been in that succeeded state. The second one is um, in error, so that would be in that failed state. And then the last one is eviction, is also in the failed state. And if you look at it, only the evicted one is the one which didn't have a pod IP associated with it. So if you were looking at this from a pod life cycle perspective or consistency, you would think for consistency, it should be having that IP on it. Um, so that's kind of what the refactor did. Uh, it ensured that that IP was kept on the evicted, uh, in that evicted state. We don't remove it because that's what the pod state, uh, that's what the pods look like. It doesn't matter what state you're in, your IP shouldn't be removed. The other key thing that changed is probes are shut down before the pod is a marked terminal. So that will be kind of key a little bit later on. Um, yeah, so that, this is basically the change that has happened. And so far, if you look at it from a pod lifecycle standpoint, this makes a lot of sense. And it's actually kind of cleaned up some of the confusion or clarity in some ways because now you know what the pod life cycle should look like. Um, so we're gonna now move into the, the network side of things. So services and endpoints and what happens when we're processing these events. Uh, the controller manager, which has our endpoints controller, they watch for these pod updates. And when it gets a pod update, we see, oh look, this pod got deleted. We should remove the endpoint from our endpoint list Cube proxy that's sitting on the node is reading these, and once it reads it, it says, this pod no longer exists, let me remove it from IP tables. Um, and this is kind of how our node networking works when you're depending on it. Um, however, if we go into the bus, hopefully you can read that, there's two kind of key pieces here, and so I'm kind of digging into the endpoint code now to kind of just show you the subtlety of this bug. Uh, the first line, is telling you uh, if there's no IPs on the pod object, skip this pod. We don't care about it. We're not going to include it. The second one, um, we're going to ignore the tolerated, uh, the, yeah, tolerate on ready endpoints, but the next piece is the deletion timestamp. Um, if the pod is deleted, obviously we don't want to include it. We don't care about it, so let's skip it. So if we go back to um, the, our diagram, what this really means is if the kubelet is now actually only marking pod states as terminal, in an eviction case, that means that the pod actually doesn't get deleted. And instead, uh, we also now don't remove the IP. And a key thing about evicted pods is they stick around in the API. Um, and they stick around until you get a threshold of it, and then pod GC goes and looks and finds all these orphan pods and removes them. But there is some time when these terminal pods can exist in the ecosystem. And that's kind of what's happening here is because now pod, the pod state is terminal, not deleted, and it has an IP, what ends up happening is if we look back at the code is the, uh, next slide, yeah. Uh, what ends up happening is it's actually failed, it passes both those checks, and now this endpoint is now included into our endpoint list. Um, and if we go dive a little bit more deeper into the endpoint code, we do have a few more checks that we're trying to do. Uh, and namely, it's this little if condition um, that is checking if a pod is ready or if the pod is um, not ready, basically. And when we get to that ready state, that is purely based off of that kubelet uh, update, right? The probe update. The second piece which is, uh, should pod be an endpoint, if we zoom in a little bit closer, you can see that it has, it actually does check for that terminal state, but it expects that the pods are terminal, like pods that have a, you know, definitive uh, lifetime, because usually that's dictated by the restart policy. Um, if your pod has been evicted, um, it usually means your restart policy is always, not uh, never or on failure, or something like that. So what ends up happening is this pod is considered a valid pod to include in our list, and the IP gets added to our endpoint object. Um, so if we put all of this together, uh, what is actually happening? Uh, we have 
kubelet, or so the pod gets deleted, it gets evicted, the kubelet doesn't update, the, uh, doesn't remove the IP, the endpoint controller says, hey, this pod should be included, adds it in, but the one nice good thing about it is it's marked as unready, and then we get to kubeproxy, kubeproxy will remove it from IP tables because it's marked as unready. Now, we've kind of been saved in this scenario because our endpoint object is incorrect, but kubeproxy kind of, it, it was incorrect and it had the unready, but kubeproxy is able to kind of work around it. And in the end, this shouldn't really affect your uh, routing decisions unless you're consuming endpoints and endpoint slices by yourself and making other networking decisions based on it. So overall, this is kind of, this is a bug that exists, but it doesn't affect us too bad. Um, however, the story kind of gets a little worse, so I'll pass it back to Antonio. Hmm, okay. So, I think that by now it's more or less clear how this works, right? Everybody uses services, everybody uses endpoints, and as, can, as you can see, there is a lot of chain reactions in between. Um, the other consequence of this change on the pod life cycle was that we have another nice feature for, for services endpoint that's called a terminating endpoint. So most of you that wants to deploy services and want to have a zero disruption or something like that, you just don't want the endpoint to go out of the, of the service uh, just when you delete. You want to have some grace period so that pod can receive traffic, okay? So for that, in Sync Network, we, we implemented the terminator endpoint feature. What does it mean? It's just the pod state is no longer binary. So it's not ready and ready. It's ready, it's unterminated. You can send me traffic if you are ready. So we have this special condition in the endpoint slice controller that is allowing to send traffic to, to pods that are terminated. And one of the consequences of, of this refactor was uh, another, another bug. The, the, the problem was, okay, the problem was that during this refactor, when the pod was going down, we forget to, to, to keep the probes. So <laughs> the code was, was uh, when the pod is going down, you have the probes that, that has been it before to say, I, is the pod ready? And the pod should angle, yeah, am I ready? But the problem is that during this shutdown, the probes were removed. So the kubelet couldn't know what is the state of the pod. So what happens in this situation? So the problem is that in this situation, the endpoint controller assumes that the pod is always ready, meanwhile it's terminated. And what if the pod was already there or is not ready, is not reflected. So you end sending traffic to a pod that is dead. And this means for people with ingresses or other kind of services, you are going to have 404 or connection dropping. The fix was really simple for the people that know, of course. And it was just, don't just keep the props working meanwhile the pods are terminated, okay? So, and after this, what are the lessons that we learned? I think that we are going too fast. Well, okay, we have more time for questions. So the, the lessons that we learned is all, the, all these behavior changes can break others. And what's important with this? The important with this is that we, we need to, to establish contracts on the code. And the best way to establish contracts is adding chain. Right now, until 1.22, it wasn't clear how the pod life cycles will work, the concept of pod terminal, although those concepts maybe they were clear, but we, we didn't have tests. And the rest of the people, the rest of the seeds were building their system based on different hypotheses that when the code enforced the contract, it started to break. And as you can see, uh, everybody uses services, but only a few people really understand what, what is the whole chain of, of events that you need to, uh, from when you create the service to the, when the pod receives the traffic. So. 
And what that implies, that when you have a broken telephone bus, mm, things are very complicated, and, and you need help from other people that have the knowledge in their area. So it's impossible that one person can, can solve this kind of, of bug solving. Um, we don't have anything else. Right now, this was a complex bug. This uh, affected a lot of people. This was solved with the effort of a lot of people. Some of them are in, in the public, so we don't want to take the credit for certain and I mean, <laughs> only. Uh, I don't know if you have some questions or whatever you want. We are here. That's all. Uh, okay. I don't know. Hey, no, this is not what. What's the best way to get attention of another SIG? Because I know we don't always jump immediately on problems or things that other SIGs. You know, we try, but we don't always do that. So, what have you found is the best way to engage another SIG to help collaboratively solve bugs like this? Well, I think that this uh, goes down, boils down to this picture. Connection. I mean, I know Porter that was working in, in this thing, and I knew that he was working in that area. So I reached out. So th that's the thing with open source. You don't have verticals or structures or, or procedures to communicate with others. And that's, that's where, when it's important, this friendship and, and, and these events and everything is. You need to get to know the people, and you need to get to us. And, and don't be afraid of asking. I mean, all of us commit mistakes and add bugs and, I don't know, and ask naive questions. So don't be afraid, just ask. I'm, for example, a very verbose people, so I go to a channel and I, keep asking on the channel, and there is always one person that is going to reply. And if it is not going to reply, you need to think, maybe I'm doing the wrong question, maybe this is not the right channel, but I don't think that there is a magic wand here. It's people, we are people, just know each other, just ask questions, and I don't think nobody is afraid of answers. But there is no process. I mean, <laughs> you can open an issue and it can, I mean, we have the bots crossing a lot of issues because get rotten. So just use these opportunities, travel or use the meetings, the weekly meetings, use the mailing list, whatever you are more comfortable with. But just let's meet people. You know, so that you want to. Well, I was going to say it's just I have the same answer. You know, you have to kind of. I mean, it's both a, a blessing and a curse because unless you know people, you don't know who to reach out to. Uh, but I think I really like what Antonio said, just ask questions. Uh, I have not met a single Kubernetes contributor who did not want to answer my questions. So uh, I would continue to think that that's probably your best solution. And somebody, if you start messaging in the, lar in the larger channels and doing some at alls, maybe not always recommended, but every now and then, uh, you will get a response, yeah. I think Antonio's suggestion, too, about, you know, if you need to, you could just go attend that SIG meeting and highlight your bug. We know that's happened a number of times for SIG Network and other ones. Also true, yes. Hey, nobody has doubts about the points? I cannot believe that. I mean. <laughs> also, I mean, if you are users, before the, the next question, if you are users of Kubernetes, other thing that's important for us is we don't have a QE team. We have users. And I mean, it's sad to say, but users are, are, are the first ones that. QE is CI is, uh, is something that I don't want. We, we have a sick testing meeting tomorrow that I'm going to talk about CI. So. But 
I was checking for the same. This is our feedback, and this is you, users. I mean, use Kubernetes, report the bugs, and, and, and help us to make this better. Sorry, I can go ahead. Um, I was wondering if you could detail the process for navigating like inner organizational communication barriers. So I know you said you uh, were at Red Hat at um, Google. Do you have any you could uh, like describe that process? Are you asking like how Antonio and I co collaborated? Uh, yeah. Um, so I mean, I think every project is a little different. Um, for me, I think the I'm relatively newer to SIG Network than Antonio is, and uh, I just started attending the meetings. We start learning some names. Uh, I will say, you know, once you learn some names who come often, you kind of feel like, oh, I can reach out to them, ask them questions. Antonio also reviewed quite a few of my PRs and. Uh, and then you just start reaching out on Slack. Um, and once you develop a relationship, it kind of continues, like it's not going to end. Um, and then through Antonio, I met other people. Um, also working at Google, there are other contributors. So I do, you know, you can meet someone who'll be like, oh, talk to so-and-so, they might help you. Uh, so if you are not a contributor who has this big group, I would say first, you know, go to that meeting and just kind of see who are the faces, see who are the names. Uh, typically, I think most of them start off with triage and like you'll see people's GitHub names. You'll, I think a lot of people also try to make it really easy to find them on Slack and then the name that they have on the meeting. So in general, I think people are open to it um, and you just, that first step might be hard, but definitely just go ahead. Even if you say, hi, I'm, I'm interested in this, I'm pretty sure you'll get a pretty welcoming response. I mean, I think that all of us in, in Kubernetes and in most of the open source projects, you really don't look at the company of the people. I mean, I only know the people by the GitHub handle, so I'm not, not the right person, but I really don't know the company of the people, or I really don't care. I mean, we have the same goal. It's fixing the bug. Actually, this bug is happening at Red Hat. It was reported internally, it happened and at Google were reported internally and we happened to work in the same bag together. I mean, with you know, different origin, but with the same goal, that is fixing Kubernetes, not fixing our uh, company. I mean, we have to fix our company things, but this, the conclusion is that you, you forget about companies and, and this thing is about contributing and, and making things better for users and everybody. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. First of all, awesome presentation and gets a really awesome summary of this uh, of all the issues here. Um, I had a quick question. So one of the interesting things I think this arises is like uh, there's certain invariants and kind of guarantees in Kubernetes around different lifecycle, right? Whether it's network, endpoint slices, pod lifecycle, et cetera. I'm kind of wondering what your suggestion is and what you would find helpful is like how we communicate those guarantees across different SIGs and broadly in the community. Is it just like documentation or how do we kind of specify like this is the lifecycle, this is when this field will be set, this is what you should depend on if you're writing a controller? I don't think there's an easy answer just because I, I do think documentation is the first step. If you, the components you own and this is the behavior that you've defined, at least there's clarity there. Um, if somebody asks you something, you can point to them and say, hey, this is the thing. Um, and it's great if documentation stays as up to date as the code, but code is sometimes hard to navigate. Uh, in terms of spreading it to other consumers, especially consumers of your API, that's really difficult. Um, I think one thing we've learned is from SIG Network, we're dependent on the pod life cycle. So we added a test so that way if an invariant changes, we can either let you know, SIG node know or we can, uh, we're aware when we're coding. And I, I think it unfortunately falls a little bit to the consumers, right? You need to be aware of the APIs you're using and you need to make sure if you make an assumption, you either have it tested or you have it very clear. And um, 
obviously now I can tell and say, hey David, can you go and make sure any changes to these areas, let SIG Network know. But until something like this happens, I don't think you knew about this dependency and even we didn't know what, about this dependency. So it's like, a, I don't think it's a, uh, a panacea to all problems, but I do think documentation is a good first step. I'm more radical at tests. I mean, test and test, and you have something, you put a test. If somebody wants to use something that's not the supposed to way to work, it's going to fail the test. And that way, I mean, documentation is great. And we have, this fault life cycle is well documented. I mean, it's pretty well documented. But the problem that we have here is that the contract wasn't enforced. And one controller was, you know, making the interpretation of, of, of that contract, but wasn't enforcing. So I think that is in, in, in this case, in, in hindsight, is, is a, a problem in SIG network. We didn't have a test to cover this. We assumed that in points and node wise cycle was this ideal thing. And I mean, we have to do both. We have to document things to know how it works, so, and then we need to add tests to, to know that we don't regress. That's what I say, it's not magic. It's test and documentation. <laughs> we have that. Makes sense. Thanks. OK. Last one. Yeah, thank you. This was a really cool presentation. And I think that you mentioned that uh, you know, there was a disconnect between the like testing and network six here. And I'm kind of, kind of curious, like, how many people are active in multiple SIGs at once? And then how do different SIGs like prioritize like their issue backlog based on things that other SIGs bring up? Uh, I need to, I mean, I really didn't, can you rephrase, and I didn't get exactly what. Sure, uh, yeah, mostly the second one, but like how do different SIGs prioritize the things that they're working on based on what other people bring up that are outside of that, that specific SIG. Okay, okay. I mean, that's, that's the complexity of a product like this. I mean, I'm working in open source, I'm working with companies. Uh, you, you don't have, and, and that's the problem, it's more on the people got feeling. I started to work in, working on this in Valencia. I'm, with some people from here, I saw this bug and started working on this. And some of them say, well, we had similar bug. And then we started working more on this because we knew that something was going on. And it just, I mean, you know something is bad and you want to fix it. And that's, this is something that is impacting the project uh, today. So I think that you can come come with the idea, I mean, this is important, I'm going to delay other things, but if you tell me we have a backlog within some points and priority, I, I mean, I personally don't have that. I, we try to do that on the six. we try to prioritize, but at the end I think that's more about the people and the gut feeling and their willingness to fix things. Of course, if, if you have a bug that is affecting your product in your company, that's going to be prioritized, but you know, because you are working in a different workflow. If we are talking about a bug in Kubernetes that is not affecting any company, this is about people, I mean. I mean, maybe you are my friend and you tell me, this is affecting me, and, I, and I, in the chat, okay, let me, I have one hour, let me check it, and I fix it. But <laughs> that's, there is no workflow or something that, we try to follow some things, but. Open source is this way. It's about people. And yeah, that's really fair. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Okay. Can we have another question or? Okay. Okay. Well, we can follow up uh, offline if you want to ask or whatever thing. Thank you.